As you're turning to Colossians chapter 4, the final passage in Roman, uh, I'm sorry, in Colossians 4 verses 7 through 18, uh, go ahead and turn there with me. Colossians chapter 4 verses 7 through 18. I'm not going to read all of it right now to us. Uh, we'll work through the passage this morning. But I want to read one uh, really concluding phrase that is given to us from the Apostle. In verse 18, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Remember my chains. Let's pray. Father, we invite you to speak to us through your Spirit, to illuminate your Word. The light which enlightens every person has come into the world, and we have seen Him, we have known Him, He has made known to us our Father. And Lord Jesus Christ, we praise you, for you are the light of the world. And we ask that that light would shine afresh within our own heart as we look into your word. Give us understanding, we pray, to the glory of Christ our Savior. Amen. Remember my chains. This is the, the apostle's final request in this letter to these young Colossian believers. It is a reminder that there is a cost to spreading the good news. One doesn't choose a life of suffering for no reason. But there is a reason. And that reason is, is that the Messiah has come. And that spreading the good news of the Messiah's coming has been the mission since the first shepherds on that starry night received the news from that angelic host and they announced it to the countryside there in that little village we know as Bethlehem. And now the gospel under the ministry of the Apostle Paul and the other apostles and now their spiritual children, including Epaphras, who is the founder and the pastor of this church at Colossae. Through their ministry, that gospel, the news that the Messiah has come, has, is reaching the four corners of the world. It is spreading, but not without resistance. As we celebrate Advent and this year of our Lord, 2021, quite a few years after this was written, let us remember our chains, that we too are bound, not physically. We're not bound as Paul probably was with a chain around his wrist or, or more likely around his ankle and that chain went over to a security guard and was chained to that security guard so that he was bound. Not, we may not be bound like that today, but we are bound to continue the proclamation that our Lord and Savior has come. That the Messiah is here. We are bound to the gospel of hope and peace and joy and love. In this Advent season, let us be heralds to this world. As the angels heralded on that dark night, let us now in our dark night be heralds that our King has come, King Jesus. With that in mind, let's look at Paul's final greetings and his final instruction to this young church at Colossae as we read this final passage in verses 7 through 18. We can divide this passage into five sections. We can see in verses 7 and 9 that he introduces the carriers of this letter and other letters. We see in verses 10 through 15 that he just gives a series of greetings from others who are with him, some in prison with him. We see in verses... In verse, in verse 16, that he makes a, a very unique request. He, he requests that they would exchange letters with other churches. In, ver, in verse 17, we see the fourth section, and that is that he has a specific personal exhortation to a man named Archippus. We'll look at that in just a moment. And then finally, we have his signature on the end, which we've read in verse 18. Let's go through these for a few moments. Paul's conclusion, beginning in verse 7, it says, Tychicus will tell you all about my activities. He is a beloved brother, a faithful minister, a fellow servant in the Lord. 
I have sent him to you for this very purpose that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they will tell you everything that has taken place here. Oh, I would have loved to have been a part of that congregation. Uh, to hear not only this letter read, but to hear Tychicus uh, read the letter and then explain and kind of fill in between the blanks. You see, Paul gave him full authority to fill in the blanks and to answer questions and to explain what the apostle meant and to give the news of what was happening probably in the city of Ephesus where Paul is imprisoned along with Luke and along with others whom he'll mention shortly. Now, in this conclusion of this letter, Paul gives us a list of names. And, in fact, he gives us more names in this letter than he does any of his other letters except for Romans. And it's significant that as we read through this, you might not catch us just reading it through once, but as you read this, it's significant that in this list of names, he includes Jews and Gentiles. He includes men and women. He includes enslaved and free. Which takes us back to what he said earlier in this letter, and he said in his letter to Ephesians, he says, in Christ there is no Jew and Gentile. There is not male and female. There is not bond and free. For we are all equal in Christ. Praise be to Jesus. This is all part of his overall plan to convey a message that the, when the kingdom of God comes, and it has, that that kingdom is for everyone. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter how much offering you put in. It doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, a boy or a girl. It doesn't mean if you're young or you're old. It doesn't matter any, anything in your social standing in life. Whatever the world may tell you, you have access to God the Father through one Jesus Christ, His Son, who has opened access to, to us. Praise be to His name. So this list begins with Tychicus. Let's take a, a brief look at Tychicus. He's the primary carrier of many of Paul's letters. And in this occasion, I, I think that he, he is carrying actually probably four letters with him, as we'll see. He's carrying the letter here to the, to the Colossians. He's probably uh, carrying a letter f that uh, Paul wrote to the Ephesians where he is, but that's a circular letter, so he's probably carrying it now to the churches in this region of Colossae, and they're all going to read that as well. He's carrying a personal letter to Philemon. We'll come back to that after the new year and see what Paul says specifically to Philemon. And then he's carrying another letter that Paul mentions here, a letter specifically to the Laodiceans. So he's probably carrying four letters, and he is entrusted with a fourfold task. Let me tell you what that is. A fourfold mission. First, to deliver these letters. These four letters. Second, to read these letters to the churches, filling in the blanks, answering questions, serving as Paul's authorized interpreter. That was Tychicus' responsibility. Third, his mission was to deliver news about Paul and about his traveling companions. And then fourth, as Paul instructs him, to encourage the local churches. That includes the church at Colossae, the church at Hierapolis, Hierapolis and the church at Laodicea. Now, as you can imagine, uh, this role would require somebody very trustworthy. Uh, I, I know as a parent, uh, occasionally I'll get a little lazy. And someone will, one child will come to me and they'll, they'll want to tell what the other child's doing. And in my moment of laziness, I'll say, well, you go tell him such and such. I say him. Uh, it could be her. Uh, but usually it's him. Uh, you understand. I'll tell one child, I'll say, you go tell him that dad said such and such. Now, what am I doing? Well, aside from just being lazy and not going and telling myself, right? I am, for some crazy reason, authorizing a, someone who might get my message all mixed up. <laughs> you understand that? <laughs> and they're delighted to be the messenger. They're delighted to go and tell and bring down the authority because they've been authorized. You ever been there? Any parents? You know what I'm talking about? They've been authorized by dad to go tell their sibling. 
and and sometimes they'll stand there like, is that all you want me to tell? Is there something else? You know, like, you know, they're, they, they want me to authorize them to say certain things. Well, I don't think that's how Tychicus was. Uh, Tychicus was a trustworthy, uh, someone who, who Paul trusted deeply, had known probably for years, someone who had shown his faithfulness to God, someone that Paul so deeply trusted that he sent not one, not two, not three, but probably four letters to be read and to be interpreted. Wow, that's, that's a lot of responsibility. And so Paul tells us, you can trust this man because notice here in verse 7, he says, because he is a beloved brother, a faithful minister, a fellow servant in the Lord. That's pretty high acc accolades coming from the apostle. This is a special man. It reminds me of this, and I think we make this application, that in many ways we carry one another's name in our hands. Have you ever recognized that? Uh, for a lot of reasons. Perhaps uh, because uh, this is true within family units. But I think this is true also within church congregation. It is true just as Christians. We bear one another's name and reputation in our hands. And so as I think about that, I think of the great responsibility that we have, especially as Paul mentions to outsiders, as he mentioned earlier in verses 2 through 6, how we are to walk wisely in wisdom toward outsiders, especially in regard to our speech. And so if we are with sinners, or if sinners are present, and we feel compelled somehow to tear down our brother or sister, what does that say? How does that testify to the love that is to exist within the family of God when there's an outsider present? You say, oh, okay, well, I'll just wait until it's, there are no unbelievers around, and then I'll tear down my... Well, no, not that either. But especially in light of the, the fact that the world is watching, and they are listening, and they are seeing a church, a church world that for now, now going on years, a church world in North America at least, that has been divided in so many different ways. And they're looking at the church, and they're saying, you know what, our world is in chaos. Our world is being torn apart politically and socially in all kinds of ways. Maybe the church will help bring unity. And they go, to church and they find out it's there too. That the church is as broken as anywhere else in the world. As divisive, as backbiting, as harsh. God sees in our speech with salt, as Paul says in verse 6. Lord, help us to be gracious that we can entrust with a deep trust our name, our reputation into the hands of someone that is a beloved brother or sister, someone who is a fellow servant in the Lord, as Paul called Tychicus, one who is a faithful minister. He next mentions in verse 8, or I'm sorry, in verse 9, Onesimus. We'll learn more about Onesimus when we look at Philemon. Onesimus, as you may know, is a companion of Tychicus. He's going to also be, have some responsibility in making sure these letters get to where they're going. But he is a runaway slave. And he has found Paul, and uh, in his runaway state, he probably left as an unbeliever when he left uh, Colossae, and he probably encountered perhaps Epaphras, perhaps Paul. We don't know the backstory, but uh, likelihood is that he, he obviously at some point came to know Christ, and now he's a brother in Christ, and now he's returning back to uh, his owner, Philemon. We'll take a look at that when we look at uh, the, the little book to Philemon after the new year. And so let's go to the second section, and that is verses 10 through 15, where Paul shares a series of, of greetings. He begins with uh, Aristarchus. Aristarchus, he says, my fellow prisoner greets you. You know, if I were in prison for the gospel, uh, I, it would be nice to have a fellow brother with me in prison, wouldn't it? Um, most famously in the book of Acts, you have Paul singing, but he wasn't singing alone, was he? He had Silas singing with him. You know, did you know this? We have no, no record of Silas ever preaching. When Paul Barnabas went out ministering on the first missionary journey, 
we're told Paul preached, Barnabas preached. We're told that there are others that preached. But with Paul and Silas, we're never told that Silas preached. Interesting. A unique ministry. ministry. Now, we know Paul liked to talk, so maybe he couldn't get a word in edgewise. I don't know. But Silas, I think, I imagine Silas as being the one who didn't have to be on the platform. But when it was time to sing, he would sing. When it was time to be attentive to God's word, he was attentive to God's word. When he, was, when he saw that there was someone that needed to, need to be encouraged, he was there to encourage them. You see, every Paul has to have a Silas. And we thank God for those people. Aristarchus, a fellow prisoner. He says, uh, Paul says, he sends you greetings. We don't really know what Aristarchus' role was, but he was probably part of that, uh, a, a, a subject, not a rioter, but a subject of the riot that took place in Ephesus that landed Paul in jail and probably landed Aristarchus in jail. Remember when Paul came preaching, people, some people agreed, some people disagreed, and they started rioting? Man, it sounds like 21st century, doesn't it? And Aristarchus was probably there serving, probably praying with people, and, and they throw them all in jail. But then he says, Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. Do you remember Mark, the cousin of Barnabas? You remember on the first missionary journey how Paul and Barnabas went out and they started out strong and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, also known as John Mark, came along with them and he, and he, was, all, uh, he was all on fire for the first part of the journey. He was a young man and he was all on fire and then I don't know what happened. Paul doesn't really tell us what happened. Maybe, uh, maybe there, are two, uh, there are just a few too many rocks thrown at them. I don't know. Maybe too many prisons that they were spending nights in. I don't know what happened, but Paul says he abandoned me. He abandoned I'm not taking him on our second missionary journey. And so Paul and Barnabas actually split up. Barnabas went on his missionary journey, taking John Mark along with him. Paul went on his second missionary journey, taking Silas with him. Paul, needless to say, wasn't too impressed with this young man. He refused to take him with him. But now this is a few years later, probably 10 or 12 years later, and we find, for the first time now, we find that in the city of Ephesus, Paul is in prison, and John Mark is present. Now, is John Mark in prison with him? We don't know. But John Mark is present, present enough to tell the apostle, hey, send my greetings too, which Paul is happy to do. And notice what he says. He says, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions, he says, if he comes to you, welcome him. Paul has changed his attitude towards this young man. Of course, in 10 or 12 years, this young man has learned a few things too. And now it seems as if Paul maybe encouraged him to visit, maybe do his own missionary journey to the city of Colossae and to, and to bring some instruction and to preach in that area. And, and, John, and Paul is saying, accept him. I welcome him. My blessing is on him. What a change. There's some application that can be made there too. One is, I, I, just, I just mentioned to you how we carry one another's names in our, in our hands. Do we not in many ways? But we also don't deny the fact that there are differences among believers. There, are, there was a difference between, between Paul and Barnabas and John Mark. There is a great division. Can I tell you, though, I'm so glad that we have this, that whatever it was that divided them, we see that there was healing here. We see later, even when Paul is writing to Timothy, he, he even asks for John Mark to come to him, for he says, he is useful for me. He, he, he means something to me. He will minister to me. What a, what a change. What a change. If, there's, if, if, if you have experienced a division, if you've experienced any sort of division with somebody, another believer, can I tell you something? As, as Paul instructs us, and God's Word tells us over and over, as much as lies within you, li live peaceably with all people. Amen. amen. Can I hear an amen from, from uh, my brothers and sisters today? As much as lies within you, live peaceably with all. God help us. Then we have uh, this third one, uh, Justice or Jesus, as was a common name in that day. We don't know anything more about this one named Justice other than he's there. And Paul says that these three men, Aristarchus, John Mark, and Justice, that these three are Jews. 
they are circumcised Jews. And they are exceptional. I think here what Paul is saying, he says, these are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God. And they have been a comfort to me. I think what, what Paul is saying is that uh, in, in this particular area, probably of Ephesus, of all of the Jews, uh, those who, who were Jews already and then encountered the gospel, these three alone have continued with Paul as fellow workers in the kingdom of God. And so he says, they've been a comfort to me. Let's go to Epaphras. Epaphras, as you know, was the founder of the church of Colossae. We've talked about him, but he says this. He says, verse 12, Epaphras too, he sends his greetings, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you, get this, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers that you may stand mature and fully assured in the will and all the will of God. Epaphras was probably the founder not only of the church of, of, of Colossae, but probably in Laodicea and Hierapolis as well. And he carries upon him the weight of being the spiritual, in a sense, a spiritual parent to these people. If you are a spiritual parent uh, here today, uh, you probably know something about the struggle of praying for that one that you're trying to disciple. If you are discipling someone, you are a spiritual parent. If you are a, a biological parent and you have children in your home, you are a spiritual parent. Just because you don't know that doesn't mean you're not. Uh, it just means you probably need to know and, and be a spiritual parent. What's it mean to be a spiritual parent? Well, it means that you are someone who is helping feed someone else who is growing spiritually and is, doesn't know how to feed themselves well. We all need spiritual parents, amen? So, uh, many of you, and I, I would guess that maybe in this congregation, I would say there's probably quite a few who would say, yeah, I have, I have a spiritual parent. I have someone who, who helps me to, to know how to follow Christ. And I'm glad, I'm glad that at least in our church and many places that, that this sort of, of spiritual mentoring, discipleship is, and we're, we're starting to realize, well, hey, this is part of God's plan. This is part of what the church is for. It's to help feed one another. It's uh, so that we're not all out there like little children don't know how to feed ourselves starving, right? We can feed one another. By the way, if the only meal you get is on Sunday, uh, you're probably going to starve. I hope the only spiritual food you get is, is what you might get here, you know, the little meal that we can prepare for you and you know, from preaching from God's Word and some encouraging songs. And, and if, that, if that's all you get, you're not getting a lot, all right? And that's not to be falsely humble. I'm just saying that you're not getting much. We need to learn how to feed ourselves through the week. And Paul is saying... Here's one, your pastor in this case, Epaphras, who struggles so that you will grow up and be mature and know and be filled with the assurance of the will of God. In other words, he's, he's separated from you. He's in prison right now. He can't be with you. And you're going to be tried. And you are being tried. And you've got to grow up pretty quickly so you can feed yourself. Some of you grew up in homes where you didn't have a father. Maybe, maybe some grew up and your mother wasn't present. Maybe some of you grew up and neither one of your parents. You grew up with, with another family member, grandparents or someone. You, you know very well what it's like for someone who is so important to a child to be absent. You know what that's like. Imagine then spiritually what that looks like for their spiritual parent to be away and they haven't been Christians for a long time and so can you imagine the struggle Epaphras must be having he's bound just like the apostle he's bound and he knows there are these young believers 120 miles away who, who need someone to hold their feet to the fire and to, to pray with them and to teach them and instruct them and yet he, he can't be there and he has to entrust that to someone else. I've used this illustration many times. I'll use it again here. I think it's appropriate. But imagine that you were assigned to the, uh, let's, let's say you were assigned to the preschool class. All right. Do we have any preschool teachers here? Uh, any preschool? All right. All right. So say you were assigned to the preschool class. So you get a bunch of 
three and four year olds, all right? Three and four. We love three and four year olds, all right? In, in small numbers. Uh, we, love, we, no, we love three and four year olds. But imagine you were assigned, so Pastor Fry comes to you and says, hey, would you, would you just, would you take these three or four year olds and, and, and be their teacher and say, sure, I'll do it. And so we, we give you, you know, how many, how many three and four year olds could you handle? Yeah, could you handle five, two, you think? 22, okay, 22, okay, all right, she's brave. And so so we'll, we'll put a few three or four-year-olds in there, and, and you're, you're, you're getting along. You're, you can handle three or four or five. And then we, we bring some more in, and pretty soon you're up to a dozen, all right? How many are starting to get nervous now if, you have, if you're responsible for a dozen three or four-year-olds by yourself, all right? And then we think, oh, well, there's more space in the classroom. Let's pack it out. Let's, bring, let's go bring a dozen more. So pretty soon you have 24 and 25 three, four, uh, three or four-year-olds. Uh, by that time, you're not, you're not telling stories or singing songs. You're just you're trying to play defense, right? <laughs> you're just trying to you know, keep every kid alive at that point, right? Somewhere between probably 5 and 25, you're going to start looking for, I need someone who's not 3 or 4 to help me, right? You're thinking, you know, you're peeking out the door and you're seeing, you know, a 10-year-old and you're pulling him by the neck and saying, hey, you watch, you know, hey, you watch these three and I'll take these 22, all right? And you're peeking your head out the door again and you're seeing, you're seeing somebody like Cindy Arndt who spent a lot of time with toddlers. You're saying, hey, you got experience, you come in here. You're looking for some other spiritually mature people, right? To help you with these young children who are already into the, into the glue and the glitter and all the good stuff that goes with working with three and four year olds, right? Well, Paphras is thinking, you know, who's there? Who's there? Now, we're going to see there, there are people there. But he's, he's burdened for not just one church, three churches. And so he struggles. He struggles on their behalf that they would grow. He says in verse 13, For I bear witness that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and Hierapolis. That's how we know probably that he was the pastor. He was the founder, the pastor of these three different congregations, three different towns. Now, these towns would have been something like, uh, like a proximity of, say, like Mulberry, Rossville, Frankfurt. You know, fairly close. But still, in that day, you don't jump in your car and drive, right? Uh, it's, it's a little bit of traveling there. Paul next men mentions Luke, Luke, and I'm going to go through these fairly quickly. Luke, the physician, we know a lot about him because Luke traveled with him, wrote the Gospel of Luke, wrote the, the book of Acts. He mentions. Uh, he also mentions Demas. Demas was later, uh, later abandoned Paul and turned away from the faith. It seems if it's the same Demas. Then he says in verse fifteen, "Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha." And the church in her house. Here's a, a woman. Uh, some many think that she may have been a widow since her husband's not mentioned. Maybe, maybe not. But she is the one who was the host. What you see here as we go through these names, these aren't just names. But we're seeing that there are people who are taking different roles within the church. Do you see that? And it all comes together for one purpose. And that is so that the word of God, the gospel, the good news can be proclaimed. You gotta have someone proclaim it, but you gotta have somewhere to go, right? Let's gather. Let's gather. And so Nympha uh, probably uh, lived in Laodicea, and she hosts a church in her house. She provides a place for the gospel to be proclaimed. Verse 16, he tells us, you know, he tells the Colossians, he says, I want you to exchange letters. He says, when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans and see that you also read the letter to Laodicea. I would love, I would love to have known what Paul wrote to the church of Laodicea. We don't have that letter. Uh, it's, it's gone. It's, uh, it has long been lost. It was not uh, one that was passed down. Now, I've had this question, and I've had this question several times. The question said, well, we know on at least two occasions that the Apostle Paul wrote letters that we don't have. We know that he wrote at least three letters to the Corinthians. Three letters to the Corinthians. We have two, right? First Corinthians, second Corinthians. But we know that there's actually one probably in between those. We don't have it. Here he mentions a letter to Laodicea. We don't have that one either. What, ha what would happen if we found 
one or both of those letters and it was somehow proven that this is authentic this is truly the letter of Paul to the Laodiceans what, what would happen would we add it to our Bible has anyone ever asked that question did you even know that he wrote other letters right, but now that you know that question comes up right like what would, would we add that to our Bible the short answer is no and the short answer is no because we know from the apostle's own testimony that God has given to us already and preserved by his spirit all that is necessary for our salvation. I would love to find that other letter, the other letters that Paul wrote. I would love to. It would certainly help. It would certainly maybe give us some more explanation of some things, but it would not add anything essential. God has preserved everything that is necessary for our salvation and what he has preserved. And for some reason, God chose not to preserve those letters. It's all in the providence of God. Amen. And so we can say, thank you, Lord, for giving us your written word. Amen. Thank you for giving us your written word. And so they're to exchange letters. There to, to, because there's instruction here that is, that is important for all believers in all places at all times. And then he says, this personal note to Archippus in verse 17, See that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. Again, as we read all these names, these are not just names, but they represent roles within the church, roles that each of us have. Now, after the new year, I, I hope, as the Lord provides and, and leads, I hope to have, uh, to, to once again teach the class, six-week class called Biblical Ministry. Has anyone here taken the class Biblical Ministry? I know we have some. Raise your hand. If you've taken the class Biblical Ministry, I know we've had, I think we probably had, a, we've only taught it once, but I think maybe we probably had a dozen or so that were in that class. Well, I, I plan to do that. That's the class that follows the Biblical Membership, and we look at some of the same passages and we break those down. But what it is, it's this. And it's what Paul uh, is, is kind of building into his, his conclusion here that all of these names represent people who have a particular ministry. They're all unique, which fits along with God's instruction to us that we're a body, that every member has been placed in the body by God himself. Did you know that? Did you know that your participation in this congregation is not just by accident, but it's by God's design? And God wants you, as part of this body, to have a place. And so that God tells us in 1 Corinthians 12, he tells us that the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. In other words, uh, let's just say the pastor cannot say to you, well, you know what, we really don't have a place for you to serve. We, there's not really a place here for you. Uh, we, don't, we don't really need your... If I, if I say that, I'm saying something different than what God says. That's right. All right. Now I might say, I, I, I don't know. I, well, let's let's look for a place. You know, nothing comes to mind immediately. But I, I know there's a place for you because God says there is. Amen. He Himself says that He has arranged every member in the body individually. Right. In other words, there's a place for you in ministry. What that says to us, pastors, board of elders. It says we don't have the option of saying, well, we don't, we don't really have a place. We don't have a place for them. We don't have that option. God's already laid down the law on that. And so I, 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 I want to say that to both as an invitation, but also as an urging to say, hey, if, if you're not involved in ministry and you, you want to just come and, and warm a bench, I hope you'll keep warming the bench, but I hope you'll get involved in ministry because God has a place for you, a call to you. As he did Archippus. We don't know what, what Archippus did. He just, he says, fulfill it. Archippus perhaps is probably the one that is remaining in Colossae. And he is probably, he's probably the, the adult in the room of toddlers. <laughs> and Paul is saying, stay to it. Don't give up. Don't run out of the room and leave these young believers on their own. Don't give up. All right, help is coming. Maybe John Mark is coming soon. I hope to come soon. And, you know, the, an, Anesimus, I'm sending Anesimus. I'm sending Tychicus. I'm sending reinforcements. You ever felt like you needed reinforcements? Now, I was told one time, 
by a fellow uh, student who also had several children. He said, did you notice that when you went from, from having you know, two ch children to three children and then four children, he said, you're, you and your wife, you go from playing, using a basketball metaphor, you go from playing man-to-man -to, -man to zone defense. You're like, okay, you got that side, I've got this side, all right? You've got all the kids below the age of 10, and I'll take the kids above the age of 10, all right? Uh, which is a really good deal if I'm the one with the older, more mature kids. But anyway, Paul is, Paul is trying to encourage this one Archippus. We, again, we don't know a lot about him, but, but continue, fulfill it, don't give up, don't be discouraged. Remember, I'm in chains. And he concludes then, he says, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Now, the way this was done is usually, some of you will know this because you, you have sloppy handwriting, uh, but uh, what would happen is they're writing these letters on, on very expensive, you understand a lot of paper like we have, right? You can't just click print and it prints out. They're, they have papyrus, and you got to make good use of your papyri. You can't waste space. And so they would train scribes to write neatly and small. Now, Paul, you remember Paul says he has a thorn in the flesh. You all remember Paul talking about his thorn in the flesh, and he prayed over and over, God, remove this thorn in the flesh. In Galatians, he tells us it's probably an eyesight problem. And so not only was Paul probably not a... a um, trained scribe. He, he could have been, but he probably was not a trained scribe. He was used to having someone else write for him. But he pro his eyesight was probably too poor to be able to write small enough to conserve papyri. And so it was normal for people to have a trained scribe, which is what he has. But when it comes to the end, Paul says, I want to sign my name on it. I, I want. And so he probably used a lot of space and he signs his name. He says, I, Paul, I write this greeting with my own hand. And of all the things that he could say, personally, he says, remember my chains and grace be with you. And so it comes back around. Remember my chains. We too are bound. We are bound. No, not in chains like Paul had experienced in that moment. But we are bound because our Messiah has come. And if you truly know Jesus Christ, you know that you cannot help but proclaim the hope and the joy and the peace and the love that God brings. And so with that, we prepare our own hearts to be sent forth from the table. I'm going to ask the gentlemen who are uh, going to serve this, uh, this morning to come and to take the elements, and we're going to be invited to the Lord's table today. It is truly right always and everywhere to give thanks to God. And for this reason, the table of thanksgiving has been prepared and is being set before us. For as often as we come to this table, we proclaim our Lord's death and profess our happy anticipation of His coming. Our scripture reading for today is 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 16 and 17. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of one bread. Would you bow your heads with me? Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, and all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our heart by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Brothers and sisters, here we offer and present to you the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as we prepare our own hearts, let us say, uh, let us commit ourselves to the Lord in this prayer. Lord, we offer and present ourselves to you 
our whole selves, body and soul, to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice unto thee, humbly calling upon you that we might worthily receive the most precious body and blood of thy son Jesus Christ and that in doing so you may fill us with grace and with heavenly beatitude and make us one body with him that he may dwell in us and we in him by whom and with whom in the unity of the Holy Ghost all honor and glory be unto thee O Father Almighty world without end Amen.